First of all, for everybody, um, thank you for attending the um, the Search Mastery series. Let me get here to our um, to our introduction page here, where we um, where we explore the foundations and practice of search search skills, education, and literacy. And um, today we have um, we have have an event that's a little bit different from the types of events that we uh, that we usually have. We usually have people from outside of the search. Um, outside of the, the search mastery um, interest group who uh, who talked to us, but we thought it'd be a good opportunity for this um, to start off the, uh, this semester's programming with an update on what the search mastery interest group is um, is doing, what we've been working on, um, what our opportunities are are coming up. <clears throat> and so uh, and so that's the topic of uh, of today. What's the search mastery group been up to? It's time it's time for an update. So uh, that, that's a topic, and we have four speakers on our panel today. And let me just introduce them to you briefly, um, and then we'll and then we'll get started with the uh, with the content. So first of all, Ira Chinoy will um, will kick off with an overview of the um, of the program and where we came from and kind of where we're where we're headed a little bit. And Ira is an associate professor at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. And he has 24 years of experience as a journalist at four newspapers, including the Washington Post, the Providence Rhode Island Journal, and um, a newspaper in Massachusetts, and one in Arkansas. And he's been on the Merrill College faculty since 2001, first as a visiting professor and, um, and now as an associate professor. And he teaches journalism history, researching um, emerging media in journalism, the use of archives as a resource for journalists, and, um, and other classes, and he served as Merrill's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs um, in the past, and he is also the Director of the Future of Information Alliance, uh, which he will give us a little bit more information about um, when he, when he um, talks to us. This, the uh, following IRA, we'll hear from Sarah McGrew, and Sarah is an Assistant Professor um, in the Department of Teaching and Learning, Policy and Leadership in the College of Education, and she'll be talking to us about the um, the the the, um, the learning materials that have been developed, as well as her research um, in the area of um, um, young people and evaluation strategies, uh, because she studies educational responses to the spread of online um, mis and disinformation. And her research focuses on young people's civic online reasoning and um, how they evaluate their materials. So so um, that's so Sarah will be after will be next. And then um, we'll hear from Beth St. Jean, uh, who is an associate professor in the College of Information Studies. And Beth will be talking, talking about um, some of her research and findings and implementation of the um, search literacy and search mastery training in, um, in the U University of Maryland in the College of Information Studies. And Beth holds a PhD and an MS in information from the University of Michigan. And she teaches classes in the um, Information Science Undergraduate Program, in the MLIS Program, and in the PhD programs. Um, and she focuses on information behavior, research methods, consumer health informatics, and strategies for assisting um, people with their needs for information, particularly with regard to um, with, um, their, their health care and their health um, solutions. And then our final um, panelist today is Ryan O'Grady. And Ryan will talk about um, a little bit of, Ryan will talk about our public outreach programs as well as uh, implementation of search literacy and search mastery specifically um, in the MLIS program and some new things that we're doing there. And Ryan is a lecturer and assistant faculty director in the MLIS program at, um, at, in the College of Information Studies. And he joined the iSchool as a lecturer um, in August 2020 as an expert in leveraging libraries to support individuals' entrepreneurial and um, career goals. Um, and he uh, he he has a lot of a um, lot of responsibility and um, and efforts providing training to librarians in Maryland and across the U.S. to facilitate library-based professional um, development. And he works with the American Library Association on media literacy. Um, education in uh, libraries for adult uh, for, uh, for adult audiences project. Um, so Ryan will um, will wrap things up, and I'll just have a little share a few resources at the very end. And I'm Mary Ann Francis, and I'm a lecturer in the College of Information Studies, and I'm the um, the program manager for the uh, for the um, 
for the search mastery interest interest group and um, you've seen me as the host of these um, speaker series before. So um, uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ira to get things kicked off and thank you, Ira, it's all yours. Okay, uh, well, good morning and um, thanks everyone for your interest. As Marianne said, I came here from a previous career of more than two decades in journalism. I came from the Washington Post where I was on the investigative reporting team and was the director of what was then called computer assisted reporting that's now called data journalism. So, you know, you could say that this idea of, you know, we now call search mastery is something that's been very close to my heart for, you know, for many decades. Um, the initiative that we're talking about today, um, you know, that we're sort of exploring and we're implementing, we're going to tell you about that. It's ways for students to improve their skills for online open web search and to develop the mindset needed to be effective searchers. And it's it's separate and apart from the training that students get in the these wonderful proprietary databases that uh, the University of Maryland um, has for students and scholars to use. Um, so when the idea surfaced a few years ago, uh, to do this, uh, there wasn't anything quite like it in the country, which is odd in a way because, you know, this is what you might call, um, you know, low hanging fruit that can improve not only students effectiveness in college, but their ability to use search um, as an important life life skill. Um, as it stands now, the initiative is based on a series of four modules, um, which you'll learn more about here, plus a pre test and post test Sarah McGrew and I published a journal article. Uh, about a year ago on the results of a pilot study that we did of these modules in the College of Journalism um, during the, the early pandemic, 2020 to 2021. Um, and spoiler alert, uh, there were important improvements in student capabilities, and, and I believe Sarah is going to talk about that. And we're now framing a longitudinal study to look at what sticks, you know, what what's retained and how can we kind of deal with that. Um, there have been a variety of players in this initiative, uh, and the most you know, the most robust of those efforts has been in the iSchool, which has become, you know, implemented search mastery across a bunch of courses, which you'll hear about, and has sort of been kind of anchoring, anchoring this, um, this effort. Um, um, and, I, uh, you know, I, I had um, some of my seniors, uh, we're, we're working through these search mastery modules in, in a class I teach to seniors, and they've already some of them had them as freshmen in journalism. They had them along the way in the high school. Um, so, you know, it, it's sort of really beginning to get out. Um, and I'm going to leave to others to talk about, um, you know, th that sort of training and also efforts to, to bring this off campus. Um, um, there are also been some efforts at the University of Maryland libraries to bring this training to student workers. And the dean there is a big believer in this. And Marian Francis oversees a group of um, Search Mastery Fellows and convenes these Zoom meetings that we have every couple of weeks so that everybody is kind of in communication with each other, sort of this, with this core group. So I, you know, Marianne asked me to talk about the, the origin story of Search Mastery. And the, these go back, I think, about seven years um, uh, in, in the thinking about this in connection with the Future of Information Alliance here on campus, which I co-founded with Allison Druin about a dozen years ago to sort of as an interdisciplinary effort to bring people together from across campus to um, uh, think about information issues in a kind of a collaborative way. You know, almost every every discipline has its own relationship with information, but what are the things that really cross those lines? And so over the years, FIA um, so-called organized a variety of events on and off campus and a regular feature um, of these events um, was having the search guru, Dan Russell, come from Google. I saw it, that Dan, I think, might actually be on this call, um, you know, and um, he would do workshops for students and faculty and librarians, and these were hands-on. Students would bring their, you know, laptops, and it would, they would generate a lot of excitement, um, and, you know, Dan is just a fabulous teacher, so, um, you know, we talked about how could we institutionalize this on campus, and before the pandemic, um, Google did provide some, um, you know, funding to kind of kickstart this. But then, of course, the pandemic kicked in. And um, one of the issues we had been struggling with was, well, how do we scale up Dan Russell? You know, how do we do that? And the pandemic sort of forced our hand, you know, forced us to think about 
what would this look like online? And then the magic sauce was the arrival of Sarah McGrew in 2019. She came here from Stanford as an assistant professor in the College of Education, and she had the experience and she had this expertise that was needed to move this forward. And um, she eventually created the modules um, for the pilot projects, uh, you know, initially to be a sort of a proof of concept. And, you know, um, again, we hadn't quite worked out how this was going to work when the pandemic hit. So we just, we took it online and um, piloted it in different places. And the students really took to it. And in addition to courses, it's being used uh, like in the College of Journals and the Howard Center for Investigative Reporting um, has adopted these modules. Um, I, I think it's worth noting that um, I, use, I give them as extra credit for freshmen who have to take a journalism history course in their first semester that's required. But I also um, use them in a course for seniors on researching the past, present, and future emerging media and journalism. And all those students um, have to do these modules. And in fact, they're doing them this week. Um, but what's important about that is they then apply them. We have a series of sort of discussions on ELMS where they have to talk about how they use the new tools that they learned uh, to carry out a particular task related to this, the project that they're doing. And they share this with each other. And that general, generally you know, introduces, um, gets a lot of energy, a lot of energy going, right? They post their strategies and they sort of see how everyone else did it. And I want to conclude my part of the overview here with just a list of premises that I circulated in various forms several years ago before this initiative actually kicked off to talk about what it might be. And so you'll see here that um, some of these have taken place and some are still aspirational. I just, you know, these were the premises. Um, so first, that students are not as effective in searching the open web as they could be with a modest amount of engaging, you know, training and um, uh, periodic refreshers. And research does support the premise that students are not effective searchers of the open web. They may think that they are, um, but they could be much better at it. So that's a, sort of a key premise. Um, we, we found out, especially through Dan's efforts, that students are excited um, when they can learn in sort of bite-sized pieces um, to enhance their, their search skills. Uh, there was no other working mod model for this, uh, to do this. So that was a challenge, but also was an opportunity to become kind of a leader in this and develop something could be taken off campus. Um, uh, we thought before this happened that a small scale pilot would be needed. We thought maybe we could have brown bag activities like how to have it be a better searcher in an hour. Uh, something that hasn't happened yet, but could. Um, we thought maybe an environmental scan would be useful to uh, sort of see what's being done around campus. Um, and maybe that, you know, maybe there could be a field study, for example, by an iSchool graduate class to help us assess the need and interest and in what actually works. Um, there were a lot of excellent materials, and Sarah is going to talk about that. Um, and um, you know, there's also opportunities for research, and which is kind of key here. We kind of can do it and research it. So we're all sort of engaged in one form of research or another about how this how this works. Um, uh, we talked again about a pilot as a way to sort of be a proof of concept uh, that there were important stakeholders around campus um, that students could be engaged in a kind of train the trainers element, which I think we could really um, could still be bumped up. And, uh, and for the libraries, um, you know, libraries don't have the same kind of alumni base that every other unit on campus has. So we had talked about this as maybe, you know, if, if this were something that were seen associated with the libraries, it could help a building block for future fundraising. So you can see that some, again, this was sort of the vision, this was the, this was the aspiration, this was the hopes um, uh, that, you know, and you can see that some of these boxes have been checked and others still are aspirational, but I think it's a good thing to have things that aren't completed yet. Um, and I think the core group interested in search mastery, some of whom you're gonna meet here, um, holds a lot of promise going forward. And that's uh, that's it for me. Great, thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna share my screen and um, we'll get into talking a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more depth about, about some of the things that Ira introduced. Um, so again, I'm Sarah McGrew. I'm an assistant professor um, in the College of Education here at University of Maryland. and very happy to be part of the Search Mastery Interest Group. 
Um, so search mastery, which I uh, sort of briefly introduced, but I just want to clearly define so that we're all clear what we're talking about. Um, we think about as individuals' ability to effectively and critically use publicly available search engines like Google, Bing, and DuckDuckGo to access and select information that addresses their information needs. Um, so just to break that down a little bit more, it includes you know, the ability to effectively use search terms that are tailored to one's, again, information needs, to effectively use search operators, to generate and tailor searches, um, to understand the architecture of search results pages, including um, things like the knowledge panel or like why, how, how individual results are presented, including like the, the titles and URLs and snippets. Um, the ability to navigate and evaluate elements of a SERP to, again, like critically read and analyze and select from the SERP. Um, knowledge of and ability to use specialized search engines like Google Scholar, for example, based on one's information needs. And then sort of wrapped up in all of that is the ability to effectively evaluate information, right? Because as we're searching and selecting and researching, we're hopefully constantly making evaluations and then tailoring searches based on those evaluations. Um, but always wanting students, of course, to be finding relevant, high quality information. So I was started to address this a little bit, but just want to dig in a little bit more on why we think search mastery is so important. Um, and that is, first of all, hopefully, obviously, right, because search engines are powerful platforms for information access, right? They are the place, uh, maybe in addition to social media, that young people in particular are turning for information about the world. Um, but their usefulness continues to be contingent on people's ability to use them well, right? Um, but, and that's a combination of skills, of knowledge, um, and, and really a disposition <laughs> towards wanting to be an effective searcher um, and evaluator of information. And then finally, we know that individuals' ability to leverage these those skills and knowledge varies really widely, um, and that it's dependent on whether they've had explicit instruction. And for the most part, in explicit instruction and effective search and evaluation skills is not part of our K-12 curriculum. So students get to college and they don't necessarily have these skills. Um, and then we don't necessarily build them explicitly in college courses, right? So we are at some, at some point graduating students from college who don't have the ability to effectively, again, search and navigate the open web. I think we do a, a better job in some cases teaching them to use those prepared, proprietary databases and stuff that I already mentioned. Um, but students really need more support learning how to search for and evaluate online information and, and college classrooms, I think, have a responsibility to do that if students don't have those skills when they come to us. Uh, luckily, we have some, some uh, strategies that we know we can teach students how to engage in them. I want to talk about just a couple of them because they form some of the foundations of the modules. Um, so when I was at Stanford, I did a study with Sam Weinberg where we looked at, uh, tried to understand how experts approached searching for and evaluating online information. Thinking, you know, we don't know what to teach people if we don't know what it looks like to be really good at searching for and evaluating online information. So we compared how professional fact checkers, uh, university professors, and a group of freshmen at Stanford, again, engaged in a whole bunch of different tasks where they were searching for and evaluating information. And a couple of the strategies that we found uh, the fact checkers returned to repeatedly were first something that we call click restraint, which seems pretty straightforward, but when we compared the fact checkers to the professors and the students, found that the fact checkers did this often and, and continuously, and the students and the professors often did not. Um, so when they landed on search results, and you can see this is a, a search for a pretty contentious question about whether Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, supported euthanasia, students often, and research backs this up, right, quickly click on the first or second result and assume that th those are the most reliable, right? And fact checkers didn't. So they exercised what we call click restraint, right? They took their time. They actually read through or scanned through the titles, the URLs, the snippets, often to the bottom of the first first page of search results right now, search results have changed. So you see more than 10 on a page, uh, but they really like kept going, kept scrolling until they found a site that they thought was reliable and that they thought would fit their information needs. Again, making some hypotheses and inferences based on what they could glean from the search results. So that's the, the sort of first, one of the first skills that underlies this is like making sure that we are teaching young people that the first result is not necessarily the most reliable and they need to really think carefully about search results. And the second is the strategy called lateral reading, 
which again, we learned from the fact checkers who, when they arrived at a, on a site or a search result where they didn't recognize the source, instead of trusting what that source said about itself, would leave the site, open new tabs on that lateral or horizontal access and go see what other sources said about that original site. And then would only return to read the site if they thought it was somewhat credible or reliable. So quick restraint and lateral reading are, some, are form some of the basis of um, these modules. And they do that because we know um, that when we teach young people skills, again, like lateral reading, we can help them improve. Like not surprisingly, but it's always a good sign um, that when we teach, again, take explicit time in the curriculum and purposely teach skills, uh, students learn them and they get better at, at evaluating information. But we don't have as much research on search skills, right? On teaching things like click restraint or on, you know, more specific um, search operators and generating search terms and whether students can get better at those things when we teach them explicitly. So our goal was to design flexible modules that were are effective, easy to implement, and could be used across different colleges, classes, and contexts, knowing that faculty may not have expertise in, in search, searching for and evaluating information, but may still want to teach those skills or feel their students need to learn those skills. So we wanted to have, again, really easy to implement modules that faculty could take, integrate into their course, um, and support students in developing these skills. So we developed um, a set of four mod asynchronous modules, so modules that could be delivered via our course management system, um, and that focus on some of those skills that I started to outline. So the first module focuses on how search engines work and how we use them well, um, how search engines rank and present results. Again, you can see describing click restraint, so encouraging students to, to be more careful as they navigate search results, and then to start to formulate search terms that are well suited for their information needs. Module two really digs in on how to, how to tailor searches, describes especially a bunch of search operators um, that students can use to reframe, narrow, or expand their search. <clears throat> and then using the tools menu, especially to narrow results by things like the date of publication. Module three uh, zooms out a little bit and is about uh, understanding the architecture of the search engine results page itself. Um, again, things like uh, knowledge panels and automatic answers and helping students begin to think more critically about those spaces and how the information on them is generated. Uh, and then finally, module four is about evaluating online content. Um, again, describing factors students should think about when they think about whether a website is reliable and then to engage in lateral reading to evaluate their reliability of websites. And the modules, like I said, are asynchronous. They're delivered via our course management system. So this is the, the page of module one. You can see it's not super exciting looking, but it gets the job done. Uh, and you can see there's, a, there's an introduction to each module and then sort of a, a one page for each of the topics that are in that module, including how search engines work, navigating search results, a little bit on, on busting some myths about top level domains, and then introducing students to generating effective search terms. And for the, building these modules, we really leaned on resources that already existed on the web. So places like Dan Russell's Power Searching with Google, uh, which is a fantastic set of video resources uh, that we make use of in, and link to um, in our modules. We also use some videos from a Crash Course YouTube video series that I collaborated on when I was at Stanford. And we made some of our own videos when there were, when there were topics that we felt weren't well covered by videos that already existed on the web. Um, so most of these pages just exist of a short, uh, consist of a short introduction um, and a question to think about what students watch and then the video itself, which again range between like three and five or six minutes long. Um, and then at the end of each module, there's a set of review activities that students complete to practice um, some of the skills and strategies that were introduced in that module. Uh, and then we also created just recognizing that it's great to introduce them once, but we realized that students might need cheat sheets to, re to return to, to review what they learned in the modules. So to go along with each of the four modules, we created um, a cheat sheet just to remind students of what they learned in that module. And then finally, it was really important to me to assess whether these modules were effective, right? It's great to create them, but if they don't actually work, then there's no point in using them. Um, so we designed a, a 10 question pre and post test um, that assess the skills that are that are covered in the modules. Um, so that for the sake of time, I'm not going to run through each of those. But again, we were um, careful in making sure that the we sort of like covered the, the major content and skills that were covered in the modules by the pre and post test. 
And just to give you an, one example of what that pre and post test looked like, and Beth is going to talk a little bit more about this too. Um, this is an item that assesses um, whether students could, uh, how students use search operators and particularly the minus operator to remove um, invasive search results. So we ask students to imagine that they wanna find out more about terrapins, the animal that are common in Maryland, but your search for Maryland terrapin returns results that are focused right on the sports team, Maryland terrapins. Um, so we just ask students, how would you adjust your search in order to get more relevant results, looking for them to you know, search for Maryland terrapins, but then include like minus football or minus uh, university or something to generate generate more results about the animal. So that's in the pretest, And then we have the, a parallel item on the post-test where we ask the same question, but just about a, a different content. So in this case, it's about the Michigan Wolverines instead of the Maryland Terrapins. Uh, but again, exactly the same skill is being employed. So we can see if from pre to post-test, students learn to use things like the minus operator effectively. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Beth. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation. Um, I have implemented Search Mastery in several of my classes, um, but this is a comprehensive list of where we've uh, used the Search Mastery materials with students within the iSchool. Um, more than 3,000 students now have worked with the materials, although there should there could be some duplication because sometimes they may work with them in multiple classes. Um, but there are six undergraduate courses that we've used the uh, search mastery materials within, as well as three master's uh, level courses, libra uh, library science courses, and a, a one doctoral course, uh, the doctoral seminar, which is the, the first course our doctoral students take um, when they arrive for the program. Okay, um, next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so our research kind of has a twin stream. Um, the first stream, we are looking at um, the pre and, and post test data that Sarah, Sarah was mentioning. Um, we're, we're trying to assess um, the need for the search mastery education, student learning based on the modules and how effective the search mastery um, materials are for um, getting this knowledge across. And um, as you're gonna be seeing in some charts I'm gonna show in a few slides, our analyses of the students' um, data clearly show the need for search mastery education across all of the levels. Um, and uh, we are also collecting student feedback, qualitative feedback um, regarding all the pieces, the pretest, the modules, and the post test. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and in addition, our other uh, part of the twin stream, we're looking at other areas outside the college classroom where we might be able to um, take these materials. Um, we One instance of this is we're collaborating with kids team which is a multi-generational team of adult university designer researchers and local children um, through our HCI lab um, here in the iSchool, um, trying to design a program working with kids, um, trying to uh, explore their mental models of search engines and how they function, um, see how they evaluate search results and using stories and games um, to get at this information and co-designing, searching, and information evaluation tools that will fit their needs. Um, next question, please. Um, so here's an example um, to show you that search mastery training is needed across all of the different levels um, in, within the iSchool. Uh, so this question appears on the pretest um, and the post-test actually. Um, a .org website is generally more reliable than a .com website and the students can pick true or false. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in this example, the light blue and the dark and the dark blue are both undergraduate classes. Um, the red is a library science master's degree level class, and the purple is the doctoral uh, level class. And this is how well they did on, on this question. Um, so the, the correct answer on this question is false. Um, and you can see that, you know, even at the doctoral level, there's still a considerable number that did not get it correct. Um, but it does, there is like a stepped, uh, a stepped 
uh, result where the undergraduates were were more likely to get it incorrect than than all the way up to the doctoral level. But it it shows that training is needed across across the whole levels. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And this is another example, um, just showing that that same kind of data. Um, so this one, we ask people to imagine that they're researching climate change and they come across this website, co2science.org. And we ask them to decide, is this website a trustworthy source of information on climate change? And we mentioned if you, you want, you can you know open another window and do an internet search. Um, and then they can pick from these four options. Um, yes, it's trustworthy because it has lots of information and cites scientific studies. Uh, yes, because it's a .org and it's a nonprofit. No, because the design of the website itself is outdated. Uh, or no, because the organization behind the website is not reliable. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the correct answer is all the way on the right there. Um, no, because the organization um, behind the website is not reliable. Um, but again, you can see across all of the levels, um, you know, even looking at that first option, yes, because the website contains a lot of information and cites scientific studies, nearly half of all the different, uh, you know, levels of students uh, selected that. Um, but it actually uh, is not trustworthy. Um, so that's just another example. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so these are some current data, more current data that we're working with right now. And um, this slide and the next slide, we're looking at um, the pretest and the post-test data and how they compare. Um, we're not only trying to assess learning, but we're trying to make sure that our pretest and post-test are parallel um, so that we are, you know, measuring true differences. So that's part of what we're looking at. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Um, this is the most recent data. Um, so last fall, I used the search mastery materials with brand new UMD these students, they're, they're freshmen. Um, they're taking a My Living Learning Community um, course called Health Justice, Investigating the Roles of Information and in Preventing in Health Disparities. Um, and so this is uh, the data from that class that we're, we're working with right now, um, looking at the, the differences in the pre and post test data. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so the next uh, three slides are all feedback, just examples of feedback we have gotten about the Search Mastery um, modules and materials. Um, so we'll start with undergraduate students. Um, and I've kind of highlighted the, the crux of each quote. Um, so there being lots of new things I didn't know about and I needed information on it, but I didn't know I needed it. Um, search Mastery modules helped me with my day-to-day -day life searches. Um, search Mastery modules were very help helpful. They taught me a lot about the internet that I hadn't known. Um, they helped to help me to get to results uh, that reflect what I'm really looking for. Um, never knew these things. It's very fun to learn in this way. Um, and then this last quote, um, I mentioned that some of the students get the search mastery training, various aspects of it uh, across multiple courses. And so we were concerned, like, OK, are they going to be like, oh, I already had this. I don't want to do it. But they're not at all. Um, this is sort of the overwhelming uh, feeling um, that it was a nice refresh. I was I've been able to use these skills in other courses and other positions. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, thank you. And so the next group is library science. Uh, so students pursuing their their master's in library science degree. Um, and you can kind of read through. There's you know a lot of things that I should have remembered from the librarian in high school um, when she discussed uh, search strategies. Um, they were fun and short. Um, Pretest was great, made me think about what, what, what is search mastery? What does that entail? Um, another student uh, said, none of this was even in existence when I went to school, so I never received any training on it. Um, it will make my sharing more efficient. And then she's speaking uh, specifically about the .org.com, uh, using, you know, using that to judge the credibility, not being such a great idea, and saying, I'll be sharing some of this information um, with with my students. Um, and then 
uh, next person, I, I got to learn so much more about searching. I wasn't aware of how little I was using or how little I knew about something I use so often. Um, and the last one, they contain excellent information that I'm happy to have learned. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. And then the last category were um, doctoral students. And um, you can see this first quote, um, she wants to study the information search literacy skills of fan fiction readers. And she feels like the search mastery um, modules are a really useful tool. And she said, personally, she feels more confident in her searching skills um, after completing the, the modules and the pretest and post test because um, what she had done was included as a potential answer. So it gave her confidence. Um, and then this last one, the, the student is saying, um, you know, I feel like things like this were included in classes and I would assume they would be taught earlier, but then she catches herself and says, well, I guess that assumption is part of the problem, similar to the all kids know how to use all technology fluently nonsense that people sometimes attribute and then use to not actually um, teach basic skills. And she mentioned the idea of looking critically at resources and search results is an important part of literacy, uh, especially given the increasing focus on misinformation. Um, okay. Um, okay, now we, I pass it to Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Um, so not only did we see opportunities to work with students here at the university, but we also thought, where else can we bring this? Um, and so we developed an initiative to what we call public outreach, right? Um, and specifically, we're talking about public libraries in this context. So what I'm going to do is I'll walk you through in the next couple slides how we've been working with public libraries, uh, also in collaboration. And I do a lot of this work with Marianne. So as you can see here from, oh, sorry, can you go back? Uh, as you can see here from this slide, I like to start with the end first. So this is what public librarians get when they uh, complete the, the four modules that we've been talking about. Um, and I'll go through the history of how we've kind of tweaked these four modules, but the base that Sarah put together and that this group um, added on to is what we use for public librarians as well. And so you can see here, they get a certificate, they can use it for, you know, continuing education credits, things like that. And then the, the image on the right is the portal that they log into for our open learning here at the University of Maryland. Thanks, Sarah. Next. Um, and so what's the goal here, right? So when we talk about search better, you know, we rebranded search mastery into something that could be, I think, understood a little more easily by people who practice this and do this in the field all the time, because mastery, I think, is, you know, more academic. So how can we just help improve people's skills? Let's search better. Um, so we call it search better, and that's the branding. And, you know, essentially it boils down to what we've been talking about today, which is a set of four online modules. And what, what they've been, they've been created to help librarians then help patrons, right? And transfer those important skills that we've been talking about. Because everything that Ira talked about, everything that Sarah talked about, you know, these are skills that perhaps uh, people we think that we're really good at, but uh, why not practice and learn more so that we can get better and better? And so I've created here, we've created here, um, you know, sort of like a learning guide because I find too that people who are in the field doing this uh, for jobs every day, they like to take handwritten notes. So this is a, a form that they can print out and take their notes as they go through the modules or just take notes for later as they like. Next slide, please. So, you know, getting to the core here and trying to work with and collaborate with public librarians on how this can be useful uh, are a few questions that we went through here, right? So uh, searching better and search better, how we branded it, what does it mean? Well, it means searching for the information that the patron needs, that you need, and not just relying on what the search engine returns to you. It's a great tool. It's a great first step. It's a great start. Um, but like we've talked about with students, instead of just clicking on those first few links that come up, do they really contain the answer to the question that you have? Um, and so what about when a patron comes and they want a specific type of file, like an image or a PDF? How can you structure uh, your search so that that content comes up first, right? Um, what if you're searching, you just get too many results? Um, what if you're looking for something very specific? 
more specific content? What if you're looking for something in a certain date range? What if you just want more relevant results? Um, and how do you uh, do lateral reading and make sure that the information that's coming up is valid? These are all perfectly uh, uh, good examples uh, what happens when a public librarian works with a patron, a customer, a user, right? Um, they're coming up and asking these kinds of questions. And so uh, designing the four modules with public librarians has helped us to uh, help additional public librarians understand and work with this material so that they can help those who come into their institutions. Next slide, please. So we saw this as an opportunity, right? Um, as we've talked about, and I just want to hit these themes again, the centrality of these platforms to our lives is undeniable. Um, when I uh, fire up, you know, my, my web browser, I, I'll just type in, I'll just type in my question and, you know, something will come up, right? And I think that this is the experience that a lot of folks have. Um, so how can we get better at that, right? That's, that's the crux of what we're trying to teach and learn together. And why? Because it's part of our daily lives, because it will make us better um, uh, civil, uh, it'll make us better uh, civilians, right? People who are working in, uh, in civic engagement. Um, and so while there's few opportunities um, to develop these basic knowledge and skills, uh, we're, we're hoping that through this, we have these critical tools that will help effectively uh, navigate. Um, and so people use search platforms all the time. They, this promotes this false sense of comfort, which we've talked about. Um, so people think that they're already really good at this. They think that they're master searchers um, and, and they may just have superficial knowledge. So the hope is that by uh, working with librarians to design this and then teach this, these skills will transfer over to patrons. All right, next slide, thanks. So what's the history here? What have we been doing? Um, so in we've been a group for a few near, years now, but I'll take you all the way back to spring of 2021. We were already, uh, I think, maybe a year, year and a half into this group being formed. Um, what we did is we decided to take this to public librarians, but what better way than to ask them what they feel they need to help patrons more. So we uh, held a small focus group together with public librarians just from Maryland, because our focus at first was, well, let's just try and look out into our own backyard, so to speak, uh, and work with public librarians here in the state. And so what we did based on that feedback, based on those folks going through the modules, is we reconfigured them. And we created what I've been talking about so far, which is search better. So up until present day, you know, through 2021, late 2021, 2022, and now 2023, we've been able to reach um, over 150 librarians, uh, public, public librarians. And this is not just in Maryland, but it's also in surrounding states because we've um, tried to develop contacts in uh, the states of Delaware and the states of Virginia. And so our goal really is to grow this. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the training now has search challenges, right? We've rebranded as search better for public librarians. We've rebranded it as search challenges, which I think is, you know, a common uh, understanding of, of a challenge. Hey, try and find this out. Try and do this, right? Uh, it's very much in line uh, with what, uh, you know, Dan Russell has done in the videos that we've talked about before. So expanded sections, also searching for reliable medical information, privacy and security information. So what are we looking to do in the future with this group and this, this outreach? Well, you know, we started at 100 or we started at 50 at first, right? So let's go from 100 to 200. Let's go from that to 500 to 1,000, as many as we can. And so that's really our goal. I think we, um, we're we going to write a two-year plan coming up soon. Uh, so Mary and I are really looking at how can we do more outreach to uh, more public librarians in more surrounding states, you know, potentially even working with private industry next or taking it uh, even further outside of the states that are surround Maryland. Okay, next slide, please. So what I want to do now is shift because I've been talking a lot about um, the, the public outreach, but let's go back to what we're doing here uh, at the iSchool. And so this will be my last few slides here. So we took a look at the core courses for the MLIS degree here at the University of Maryland. And based on student feedback and based on our own experience uh, as instructors and as the team that runs the program, we thought, well, we don't have a, a foundations course. We don't have a foundations course for librarians and information professionals. So what we did is we created one. And um, there's many units that comprise it. But what we started to do was take some of uh, what was being done with search 
out of another course, which was 602, and put it into our foundations course, 600. Um, so it's a, it's a foundations course. Students are uh, slated to take it in their first semester here. Uh, because as we've talked about, right, there's not a lot of this education that goes on through K through 12. We're doing it in undergrad here. You know, we question whether undergrads are getting it everywhere. But once you get to the grad level, this is also important, as, as Beth showed. It's even important at the doctoral level, right? Um, so students take this in the first semester. It's one unit, which we're saying lasts either two to three weeks, and it's dedicated to search. And this is relevant to their lives. It's relevant to also an assignment that they'll do at the end. Um, their final project is research-based. Their final project is looking at a problem or an issue that's happening in the field, in an institution that they're interested in. Um, and and searching for information on it and and creating you know a bibliography and trying to find solutions. Um, next slide, please. So this is the this is the uh, where I start to go off the deep end, right? Um, so what's the goal? Why am I doing this? Why are we doing this in the foundations course? Well, of course, it's everything that we've talked about. But I think the big goal here is to tackle the big questions of what is going on present day. Um, because if you've been following the news, or you already feel like you are a pretty good search expert, or not, or you could need more, right? Um, wh what's happening here? Because there's this thing called ChatGPT that has come out, right? And that came out late 2022. And at first, people were discussing it as, is this just a fad? Is this going to change the entire landscape? Is this going to change the economic model for how uh, search engines work? And so I very much don't have any answers for you today. And that's why I'm talking about going off the deep end here, because what I intend to do is work with students and hear from students and have students explore, right? And so the question I'm going to ask students is, where is search today? And that's what we're going to do in that foundations course at the very end, after we build these basics up, is now that you know the history, now that you know how to do perform some of these searches, um, what might do you think the future look like? How is it looking now? Because again, if you've been following the news just in the past few days, the past few weeks, right? We've had products released uh, by Microsoft Bing where they've put in, they've integrated chat GBT. Um, Google has Google Bard. Um, so there's lots of different um, solutions, AI infused solutions, uh, or I don't know if solutions, but AI infused products, things that are happening now with search. And so I think you've already seen this, right? If you, if you follow the trajectory of how search has worked at first, when the engines came out, I just listed everything. Then algorithms got smarter, better. And then we, we come close to present day where rich snippets were happening um, and direct answers where you would search, like I said at the beginning, right? I just typed in a question and something hopefully pops up in the search engine that I'm using. Um, where, you know, there'll be a knowledge panel on the side, which gives you all those important facts right away. You don't even have to click on the page. It just, it's just showing you right there. So when you turn that into a conversation and you can now have a chat, um, what does that look like? And again, I don't have the answers, but I think this is something that I'd like students to explore uh, and it's happening right now. So it's a really good topic to put into the course, the foundations course. And this is the first semester that we're doing it. So I'm very much, uh, and uh, Ursula, who's also teaching the other section, we're very much learning this as we go along as students are. Okay, next slide, please. Which is, I think the end, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Marianne. You can see there at the top, which is our link to our group website. Uh, also, thank you very much for tuning in today. Here's all our contact information um, and we'll go to questions, uh, but I think I will turn it over to Marianne for that part. So thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate being able to speak with you today. So first of all, um, let's see if there, if, if there are questions, people can put them in the chat. And while we're, um, while, while, while we're waiting for those, first of all, I want to thank all the panelists because it was really super, um, super um, interesting uh, content that you guys, that you guys uh, brought to us. I do have to, uh, a couple other things to show you guys. Which are, um, we have some resources. And um, th these are so. So we have a website, and it's you can find it by you know cert by. Um, um, I don't have a link here, but but um, I can get you the link, or you can find it. It's on the uh, on the University of Maryland um, umd.edu. You should be able to find it right there in the search bar if you want to exercise your search skills to find the search interest group. 
Um, we have linked there some resources. They're a little bit old. We've been um, working with, we've been developing some new ones that I want to tell you about and show you. And um, those should, they should be linked um, shortly. Um, we've got a list of um, search related videos, first of all, that uh, we developed based on some initial work that uh, that Beth St. Jean did. And then it's it's been um, it's been updated there. This is what, kind of what it looks like. It's a list of up to uh, about 75 different video resources um, on different aspects of search that's keyworded, which we're going to try and make it a little bit prettier. But um, right now it's in spreadsheet format and the links are all here. And you can tell when they were um, when the videos were made and how long they are. And you might find some of those um, some find some of those useful. And also in that same spreadsheet. Um, is a list of, um, of different types of documents that are uh, that are available. Different, actually, they're, they're cheat sheets, other kinds of cheat sheets and things for um, different types of search um, uh, search pra search practices. Then we've got um, a, a, the, then we have a resource. It's a list of documents that are available that you might find interesting. Um, and then the the third um, part, the third piece that we have is a list of the. It's right now. Um, uh, right now it's 12, and once we add this one, it will be 13 uh, videos on our YouTube on our YouTube channel that are um, that are from from the speaker series, and a cup and um, many 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 of them are super interesting, and they're usable either for uh, for you, for you to learn yourselves to share with others. They can be teaching uh, resources as well as learning resources, um, and so you can, you can uh, take a look at at any of, of those as well. Um, Let's see if we have, a, we might have a question. Oh, okay, Beth is saying that um, the Gig and Jindal um, compiled the initial list for us uh, of, the, of those videos. It's been recently updated by, um, by uh, Rob Johnson, who's one of the, one of the search fellows that, that um, I think um, that somebody mentioned, or, or I guess it was Ira, the search fellows that, uh, that Ira mentioned earlier. Um, and while I'm speaking of the search fellows, I do want to mention that we have had um, great support from both Google and Microsoft in this in this program. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that, that uh, their uh, participation and, and support and Microsoft is um, helping to fund the, uh, the search fellows who uh, are who are compiling some of these resources uh, for us and doing other work as well. So it is 11.53 and um, I wanna thank everybody, but first let me um, make sure that there are no questions before we, before we wrap this up. I'll just give you a minute to see if, um, if there's anything. All right, I see one. Oh, we got it. We got a thanks from. Um, we have a, a thank you for the for the initiative. So, if there are no other questions, then I'll just will just mention um, one other thing. First of all, thank you for for um, for joining us again today, and I hope you come to our next uh, next speaker series our, our next speaker series event, which will be on March 16th, and that will feature Michael Schechter from Microsoft, who um, who has a um, very senior um, position in Microsoft and he's responsible for user experience and Bing, integra and Bing, and Bing integration. Um, he's a former graduate of the University of Maryland uh, computer science program. And, um, and when he was here the last time, he had a lot of super interesting things to say about, uh, about um, the inside out of, of, uh, of, um, of search programming and, um, and search engines. And and I, we don't have yet exactly 100% what he's talking about, but I'm sure that I'll be asking him about the about the uh, AI integration. That's that's it, that's a hot topic, and I'm sure he'll have a lot to say there. So plan to join us then. That should be a, um, a very good event as well. So I guess um, that is all for today. I'm glad everybody uh, enjoyed it. I'll stop sharing my screen, and we will we'll see everybody next time. Thank you.